premise of this paper is that when it comes to literature, reading and writing in Hebrew after 1948 is always already a response to the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. My argument here is a speculative rather than a factual one. Since the emergence of Israel as a nation state in 1948, reading and writing literature in Hebrew have been fundamentally structured by Hebrew's role as the de facto language of Israeli sovereignty. This means, firstly, that Hebrew became what the Lerz and Guattari call a major language, the abstract standard measure whose expression and content constitute the Israeli Jew as a sovereign majority. Hebrew is thus inextricably entangled in Israel's apparatuses of self-legitimation and self-definition as a nation state. Secondly, and consequently, in its use as a major language, Hebrew constitutes radically different perspectives of the conflict for Palestinians and Israeli Jews. For the Palestinians, Hebrew plays the role of the antagonist in what Albert Mami described as the linguistic drama of colonial bilingualism. It signifies the ghostly presence of their occupied or lost lands, of the Arabic names of their villages that were Hebraized, and of the laws and policies that shape all aspects of their material lives. For Israeli Jews, however, Hebrew seamlessly conjoins the sacred language of scripture with the secular modernity of civic life. Concurrently with the argument for the inherently theological dimension of Hebrew that constitutes the political project of Zionism, I would argue that in its use as a major language, Hebrew actively blurs and represses the tension between the two mutually exclusive constituents of Israel's civic identity, the Jewish component and the democratic component. Thirdly, if reading and writing in Hebrew are a form of usage of the language of sovereignty, and if Israeli sovereignty is inherently pre predicated on, on the conflict with the Palestinians, then doing literature in Israel necessarily implicates Israeli writers and readers in their nation's way of administering the conflict. Consequently, the question of reading and writing literature in Israel can always be posed as an ethical political problem of responsibility. I will briefly visit this point in the conclusion of my presentation. Deleuze's literary clinic offers an enabling means to explore the political dynamics of Israeli literature as an artistic research practice. This means approaching Israeli literature as both a clinical symptomatology of life within the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict and a critical fabrication of alternative visions of life. Deleuze's imminent method requires that evaluative criteria of the literary response will be, re will be engendered by the problematics set by the work itself rather than by transcendent values or presuppositions which remain safely beyond the reach of critique. Such an approach, therefore, also involves an account of the work's stance on the question of responsibility. For Deleuze, literature is a question of health, and artists and writers, and I quote, are themselves astonishing diagnos diagnosticians or symptomatologists. They are essentially clinicians of civilization who have seen, quote, something in life that is too great, too unbearable also, and the mutual embrace of life with what threatens it accedes to a vision that composes the persons of that life. The style of an author is always a question of freeing life wherever it is imprisoned or of tempting it into an uncertain combat, as Deleuze says. And in some writers, style, quote, is always a style of life too. Not anything at all personal, but inventing a possibility of life, a way of existing. Deleuze repeatedly insists on this point. Writing has nothing to do with the writer's memories, fantasies, or neuroses. 
This is precisely what psychoanal psychoanalytic interpretation of literature sorely miss when they treat artists as if they were patients and are determined to decipher the signs of the artist's pathologies that are supposedly hidden in their work. Conversely, Deleuze goes as far as to argue that, quote, it is not, it is only, sorry, it is not the first two persons that function as a condition of literary enunciation. Literature begins only when a third person is born in us that strips us of the power to say I. Nevertheless, I argue that once Deleuze's literary clinic becomes a lab for studying the works of Israeli author David Grossman, writing the I emerges as an attempt to resist the oppressive major use of Hebrew by which an unbearable, constrained mode of existence is imposed on both Israeli Jews and Palestinians. In his, writing on, in his writings and interviews on literature and politics, Grossman poses the problem of writing in terms of resistance to the reality of the conflict. For Grossman, what I described as the major use of Hebrew has climactic ramifications for both Israeli Jews and Palestinians' conceptions of life. And I quote him. The language used by the citizens of the conflict to describe their situation becomes increasingly superficial as the conflict goes on, gradually evolving into a series of cliches and slogans. It starts with the language invented by the systems that handle the conflict directly, the military, the police, the bureaucracy. It then quickly spreads into the mass media which report the conflict and create an elaborate, shrewd language designed to tell their audiences the most palatable story. The process eventually seeps into the private, intimate language of the citizens of the conflict, even if they vehemently deny it. Gossman describes the major use of Hebrew as a violent act of nationalization the way by which Israeli sovereignty imposes on Hebrew what I'll refer to here as state grammar, a standard usage whose sole purpose is to serve sovereign interest. Israeli state grammar functions as a logic of enmity, which could be seen as a variation of the mechanism of distinction between friend and enemy in Schmidt's concept of the political. Such logic drastically reduces language to a function of identifying enemies from within and without. Language thus adheres to a strict criterion of enmity of which the friend is only a derivative. If it successfully passed the filter of enmity, the friend is defined only negatively, only negatively as a non-enemy. The efficiency of state grammar lies in its ability to permeate all aspects of life by entrapping it in a state of constant war that compels one to make clear-cut distinctions, either you're with us or against us, an aggressor or a victim. Facing the reduction of life to such impossible choices, we are no longer living, says Grossman, but rather surviving, and I quote, the goal is survival at all costs. The cost can even be lack of living. The less you live, the more you survive. This is the paradox of a people spend their entire lives surviving in order to live and then end up living in order to survive and nothing more. Writing enables Grossman to escape survival and invent a possibility of life. Quote, Writing forces me to live rather than survive, to undo all the knots, to travel paths unbeknown to me. Writing is my way to empower this life. <laughs> Grossman's strategy of resistance to the oppressive use of Hebrew is the invention of intimate grammar, or writing the I. And I quote him, I write, I purge myself of the dubious but typical talents that arise in a state of war the talent for being an enemy, nothing but an enemy. Despite these overtly humanistic tones, I argue that in his novel, The Book of Intimate Grammar, 
Grossman becomes, as Deleuze says, a foreigner within his own language. The invention of intimate grammar works not only to undo state grammar, but also the I itself. Grossman does not revive some lost I or a primal I, um, which, had, which has supposedly been corrupted by state grammar, but reinvents the I as radically different from itself and yet strangely meaningful. Essentially, Grossman recreates the I as a vision of a life, a singularity. Intimate grammar is thus not so much an individual language as it is an individuating language, whereby the I becomes a sign or a symptom solely of itself with its own proper name. When Grossman claims that, and I quote, literature reminds us that we are allowed to reclaim the right to individuality, but also that the work of writers, and I quote again, fundamentally entails dismantling personalities, he doesn't contradict himself. Rather, he demands the political undoing of individuality to correspond the individuation of life in one and the same process. Published in 1991, the Book of Intimate Grammar is often seen as a strangely modernist novel, even a metaphysical one in which the political is but an effect of universal and existential problem. problems. The novel follows four years in the life of Aaron Kleinfeld, an Israeli boy on the verge of adolescence, who lives in Jerusalem in the 1960s. At the beginning of the novel, Aaron is an, ima is an imaginative, vital young boy of 10 years old. But then his body simply ceases to grow and he gradually recedes further and further into himself. Aaron becomes so alienated from his family and friends that at a certain point, he feels like he cannot even understand them anymore. And I quote, Aaron stood limply in their midst and felt that they worry over him like they would with some elderly uncle or a tourist who didn't speak the language. Language is a constant issue for Aaron, and critics note that the theme of language implies a differentiation between two primary languages, the adult language, which Aaron finds defiled and corrupted by vulgar social meanings and signs, and the individual language, the pure language of selfhood, which is constituted by an intimate or internal grammar. The most conspicuous characteristic of intimate grammar is Aaron's use of the present continuance tense, which he borrows from English, but which does not exist in Hebrew. This bizarre use of language led critics to identify the present continuous with Aaron's arrested development and to argue that it, represent, that it represents the frozen, dead temporality of selfhood that withdraws further and further from the world and into its lonely and falsely protective bubble. When Aaron first encounters the present continuous in English class, he rejoices at the promise for individuality it embodies. And I quote, it's as if you enclosed yourself with a sealed glass bubble, but inside, in, in the sealed bubble, much is happening, so much is happening during that time, and every second lasts an hour, and you alone learn the secrets that reveal themselves to someone who sends time like you do, and everything that happens to you there is personal. Aaron feels anxious by the thought of losing the ability to experience time in the present continuous, and it is at this point that we encounter, for the first time, his aberrant use of the agrammatical present continuous in Hebrew. And when Aaron will become fully grown like them, sturdy like them, he will whisper to himself at least once a day, I am going, I am playing, I am erroning this way. He'll remind himself that he's also somewhat of a personal errand beneath all these generalities. And just a general um, remark on the translation, I tried to uh, use phonetic alphabet, as you can see, to represent Grossman's 
transliteration of English into Hebrew, uh, this is the closest that I could do to kind of convey the sense of alienation that comes from the language itself. Following Deleuze, I would argue that this use of Hebrew constitutes Grossman's intensive syntax, a creation of another language within language, of visions uh, and additions that, I quote, are not of language, but which language alone makes possible. Grossman's intensive syntax manifested as a form of overabundance. He uses lengthy, entangled sentences which add up to enormous paragraphs. He distinctively favors commas over periods and the conjunctions and and but over any other conjunction. This overabundance also characterizes the new temporality that is born out of language, the agrammatical present con continuous which Hebrew makes possible but which nonetheless remains essentially alien to it. In fact, this form of uh, present continuous is neither of Hebrew nor of English, but is rather a pure virtuality or time itself. In Grossman's writing, English's present participle suffix ing acquires an intensive power which confers on Hebrew an exceptional form of expression. It is phonetically transliterated into a meaningless compound of the Hebrew letters Yud, no, yud Nun Gimel, as uh, you can see what is um, right here. These are the Yud Nun Gimel, the three letters that represent ING but are meaningless in Hebrew. Um, thereby actualizing a form of time which is non-existent in Hebrew. Intimate grammar, however, appears in the novel only in compound form, thereby creating additions which are meaningless in English, and yet English renders, renders them possible, such as these, these ne'elaming, holeming, choshevim, tahoring, all of these are, of course, meaningless in English as they are in uh, Hebrew. These compounds transform nouns, adjectives, and verbs into processes or events that occur in an imperceptible time. They form series of purely virtual movements that traverse the, the text. In this sense, Grossman's intensive syntax can be said to be reaching beyond language, through language, towards the outside or time itself. The more these anomalies appear and transform the language of the novel, the less Hebrew can be said to be representing anything. Rather, it expresses singularities which refer to nothing but themselves. Contrary to interpreters' prevalent view, then, the use of present continuous neither represents nor indicates selfhood's dead or arrested temporality, that is, the form of time unto which Aaron desperately clings in his sickened repudiation of adulthood and which will inevitably lead to his demise. Aaron's degenerate body is both a symptom of the degenerate way of life of Jewish Israelis and the site where becoming makes a life possible. As a symptom, Aaron's body is a manifestation of the real sickness of adult life in Israel. Survival in a state of war that knows no becoming or processes, only fixed modes of existence in the present simple tense, which is the only tense that Hebrew is capable of expressing. Matched to Aaron's horror, it seems that his peers have not undergone, undergone a, transformation, a transformation stage, but rather abruptly appear one day in the form of fully matured adults who are now comfortably fluent in state grammar. Adulthood here is not some universal mode of existence, but rather the sign of embracing the dictum of survival that compels one to make immediate adjustments and to change instantly. There is literally no time for minute transformation, uh, nuances, or critical evaluations. One should not become, but rather must be, adult or child, with us or against us. 
Hebrew's incapability to express the present continuous corresponds perfectly to the crude, clear-cut dichotomies, dichotomies set by the logic of enmity. It can be argued that this alone already makes the novel one of Grossman's most political and critical treatments of the Israeli grasp of the conflict. As a site where a life becomes possible, Aaron's body marks the disintegration of the individual as seen from the perspective of state grammar, that is Aaron, and the individuation of a singular mode of existence in a becoming, which is Aaroning. Aaron's problem is not how to freeze time and protect his inner self, but rather how to contain or endure the monumental force of life gashing through him and spreading all over. And I quote, Recently, it has become harder to disappearing. The trouble is, he no longer has where to. His inside is full and utterly stuffed. Aaron grows a bizarre set of organs, such as a cyclop eye and a mysterious gland, which is cheering in his head, telling him, and I quote, in its screeching, scratching voice through the pursed lips of the gland, Everything in the world is I, and there's nothing in the world that is not me. I am things, and I am the people using them. I am steel, and rubber, and wood, and glass, and flesh. I am cogwheels, and levers, and springs, and muscles, and straps. Aaron's becoming imperceptible, or becoming time, marks the dissolution of the individual and the creation of a world an I abundant with life, an I who is everything and everyone, and yet strictly singular, nothing but erroning. This becoming imperceptible is constituted not by the intimate grammar of a subjectivity, but rather by a grammar that intimates life and is imminent to life, a form of expressing pure time which sips through the cracks of major Hebrew. Despite the novel's ambiguous closure, Aaron's catastrophe is not, as many interpreters believe, the sign of intimate grammar's failure. Rather, it is a sign of Grossman's literary enterprise of health, for it opens up a way of life, an experience of time, which state grammar rendered impossible and inconceivable. Following Deleuze, I would argue that Aaron's becoming marks Grossman's literary experimentation as that which discovers beneath, a, a, and I quote here, discovers beneath apparent persons the power of an impersonal, which is not a generality, but a singularity at the highest point. In Grossman's novel, the impersonal force of individuation constitutes a response to a political problem the subjection of Hebrew to a logic of enmity by state grammar. And the more state grammar reduces the function of language to a vulgar enemy-friend distinction, the more it makes Hebrew strangely spacious, for straight grammar generates enormous voids in order to replace the infinity of ways of relating to others with one monotonous movement between two poles. Grossman's intensive syntax responds precisely to this problem. It fills these voids with the abundance of life and recovers Hebrew's sense of dynamis, dynamis, dynamism, di, dynamism <laughs> by exposing life in a state of war to be co coercive construction of state grammar. In the framework, in the framework of Deleuze's literary clinic, Grossman's novel not only invites us to rethink the practice of writing the I as a strategy of resistance, but also to rethink our practices of reading. Particularly, reading Grossman with Deleuze evokes the question, what a Deleuzean practice of reading Hebrew literature will amount to? It is too early to tell at this stage of the project, but such a preliminary reading did lead me to a curious discovery. It is only by tracing the relations between writing, language, and life 
in the novel that a certain detail obtains a new political significance, the 1967 war, or the Six Days War, as it's usually referred to in Israel. Grossman is often criticized for his complicity in the constitution of a false mythical image of a just and democratic Israel that supposedly existed before the 1967 Israeli occupations. While many believe that his 1987 essay collection, The Yellow Wind, anticipated how the 1967 occupation will lead to the events of the First Intifada, others consider this book a founding text of, the Israel, of Israel's false pre-1967 mythical image. But this reading suggests that in the book of intimate grammar, life in Israel before 1967 was already perceived as life in a state of war. That the logic of enmity and the reductive vision of life has already been firmly in place before the war. This doesn't so much undermine the critique of the mythical pre-1967 image of Israel as it enables a Deleuzean Jewish-Israeli reader to ask, what does it mean to create in 1991 a symptomatology of 1960s life in Israel? Could it be that through the cracks of Israel's mythical image, the political unconscious of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict returns in the form of life's impersonal power. At the hands of such a reader, Deleuze's literary clinic not only becomes a powerful tool of critique, but also a gateway to a civic position of responsibility. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mir, for this, uh, I shall, so shall I say, intriguing presentation, very political presentation. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? So I was wondering about, um, so you asked about the figure, for instance, um, there is no presence whatsoever of an interior political figure that might exist. So it exists, but it is not used. Yeah. We don't have a present progressive in yeah. Hebrew. And so somehow in Hebrew it would become constitutively impossible to say I am. So when you can say you can use the auxiliary verb when you want to say I am as in I am here right now. You can say it even in two different ways, but you cannot say anything that has a sense of becoming. The becoming okay. is is only understood from context. On, on, on what? On, on this um, perhaps already different concept of becoming because we also somehow um, almost unconsciously so seem to <coughs> align the concept of becoming with the concept of being and the concept of, of, uh, of us being present and so on. So perhaps this would also entail a completely different constellation of Well, if we speak in terms of the language itself, it's, um, as I said, we can only express, we cannot express progress or progression or continuation in any direct sense. We either need to use more words or we need to uh, create the context that it will be understood. And that's why I think that Grossman here uses a, a very political uh, use of, of this present continuous and because the impossibility to express the present continuous in Hebrew is uh, so, so inherently connected to the problem of understanding transformation because you live in a reality as if you have only two choices, these two polar choices. And 
the sense of identity or being as opposed to becoming is very strong in Israel in this sense. But I think that what is even more interesting that in Israel it is not a problem to live in contradictions. Like they don't like Israelis don't find it problematic to define themselves as fixed in fixed states, even if they are undergoing transformation. And I think that the Hebrew language really helps them do that. But I wouldn't know how exactly to to discuss or present the, the difference in such a existential or metaphysical sense that you know being is uh, experienced differently than in in Israel than in the U.S. Yes, uh, of course I think that Yiddish can be used that way. So it all depends in, in the literary piece, of course, and it's funny that you mention it because Yiddish is very present in this book. It's very present in the language of uh, the adults because uh, the way they speak Yiddish or plant Yiddish words, and he also, Aaron also sometimes gets some of them and some, some of them he doesn't get at all. And uh, he, They also infiltrate a little bit of his language, but it is very, Yiddish in this book, as opposed to the way it is discussed by Deleuze and Guattari in, in their book on Kafka, is not so much uh, a minor language as it is an aspect, I think, of the major language, of the way the major language in Hebrew is used, because it is very well connected to the Ashkenazi hegemony of, uh, of, Israel, of, of, the Israel, of Israel at that time. So in this book, but I think it is still worth more checking. Uh, in this book, I think that Yiddish plays more the part of, of uh, relating to the adulthood and the language of the oppressor rather than the language of, of the intimate grammar. And also, what's it's what, what's funny, what's interesting is that these days in Israel, Yiddish has been, after being almost forgotten or pushed aside to the margins, kind of acquired a new interest. And there are new, like in the universities, you can see a lot of people starting to study Yiddish and Yiddish departments and literature and all that. It's like it's acquiring. There's a new interest in it that it it's, could be interesting to see what it would lead to if it's going to be like a new part of the hegemony or a means to undermine it or criticize it. Sure. Thank you very much, Nir. So we will close our rich morning session. I wish you a good uh, lunch break. And